My name is Rajat Chan. I'm a PGY2, uh, sorry, PGY3 R2 at uh, Cook County in Chicago. And along with Emily Akmanek, I am the current co-chair for the Pediatric Service Line. On behalf of the Society of Interventional Radiology Resident Fellow and Student Section, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. We are very lucky tonight to have a joint webinar between pediatric oncology and interventional radiology experts from Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. to discuss the clinical management and therapy of solid tumors in children. As we all know, childhood tumors are quite different in type and etiology as compared to adults, and there are also special considerations when managing pediatric oncology patients, which many of us as trainees are not exposed to during our adult IR rotations. So we hope this webinar will serve as an informative discussion on clinically managing pediatric oncology patients, as well as the minimally invasive modalities available to avoid tumor. I want to remind everyone that tonight's webinar will be recorded and will be available on YouTube in the coming days by searching IR Education. At any point, anyone is free to ask questions um, in the question box to your right on the GoToWebinar panel, and we will address them at the end. Also, please don't forget to check the RFS website regularly for upcoming events and try to follow us on Twitter and Facebook for other updates and posting of clinical cases. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers to tonight, for tonight. We will begin with Dr. Aaron Kim. Dr. Kim is an MD, PhD, and a member of the Solid Tumor Faculty at Children's National Health System and an assistant professor of pediatrics. She specializes in sarcomas and developmental therapeutic. Her research focuses on development of novel therapeutics for pediatric cancer, including preclinical testing of novel agents, pharmacokinetic analysis, developing innovative methods for toxicity monitoring and clinical trial design. She serves as a principal investigator of multiple early phase trials in pediatric oncology, sarcomas, and NF1 associated tumors. She will be followed by Dr. Karun Sharma, who is also an MD, PhD, as well as a fellow for the Society of Interventional Radiology. And prior to joining Children's National Medical Center, he practiced primarily adult IR at Georgetown. Though now he is part of extensive collaborative and translational research aimed at furthering the use of image-guided minimally evasive therapy in children. Specifically, he's working on enhancing local drug delivery techniques in cancer and thrombosis and has been principal or co-investigator on clinical trials evaluating the role of endovascular treatment of DVT, as well as the role of chemoembolization and image-guided ablation for treatment of liver cancer. He is also actively involved in evaluating the role of MR-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound to treat pediatric conditions. So without further ado, we will now hand it over to Dr. Kim. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, just a quick question, do I put away this panel? You can see my screen, right? Yeah, so we can just see your screen, so you're, you're good to go. No one can see your panel. Oh, you can't see the webinar control panel? No. Okay, I'm gonna just hide it though. Okay, all right, well thank you so much. Um, so today, oh, hold on a second. Okay, so today I'll be talking about um, pediatric oncology and solid tumor ablation. Um, so I'll start um, with the initial overview of the epidemiology of childhood cancer in North America, and then I'll discuss treatment overviews and challenges for pediatric solid tumors, and then I'll briefly discuss uh, our current clinical trials overview for MR HIFU with local control for pediatric solid tumors. So childhood cancer, um, still a prevalent uh, concern um, at this day and age. Uh, we see about 9,000 cases a year of patients that are ages from 0 to 15 years and about 3,700 cases per year in the U.S. Um, from ages 15 to 19, so about 12,700 cases per year. And what that means is that 1 in 600 children will develop cancer by age of 15 and 1 in 330 children will develop cancer by age of 20. This pie represents uh, the pediatric cancers in America. Um, and the majority of our pediatric cancers are the leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, the second most common cancers are central nervous system tumors, which are the most common solid tumors, followed by neuroblastoma and kidney tumors. And then we have a whole slew of a heterogeneous type of group of uh, cancers including bone tumors, soft tissue sarcomas, germ cell tumors, retinoblastomas, and rare tumors. So the good news is that 
the mortality rate for pediatric cancers has significantly decreased over the past 40 years. So this black line here represents the mortality rate that has decreased from 1970 to current, and the red line represents the deaths averted. So really, childhood cancer is a modern success story of medicine. And you can just see that just by um, the outcome for pediatric patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is the most common pediatric cancers. In 1950, less than 10% of patients were cured of this disease. And today, over 90% are cured of this disease. And you'll see very similar advances have been seen in patients with uh, cancers such as Wilms tumors and lymphomas. But as you can see by this slide, this success has not been equally shared among all cancer types. So you can see that the leukemia lymphoma cancer mortality rates have significantly vast improvement over all the other cancers, um, primarily the solid tumors. Um, and the majority of the reason for this improvement has been with the real significant improvements in Wilms tumors as well as in um, low-risk uh, tumor population types. But this, again, you know, I think what we need to see is that this has not been shared equally across all tumors. Although we've had some improvement with patients with AML and high-risk neuroblastoma, you can see we have virtually no improvement with patients with brainstem glioma. Um, and we have very little improvement with patients with metastatic solid tumors and sarcomas. But if we understand the success story of pediatric ALL, this can help us inform the challenges that we face today in pediatric cancer. So one could think that the reason for this major improvement in ALL over the past few decades is because perhaps it was a time of major drug discovery. However, most of the therapy that really consists the backbone of therapy for ALL was actually drugs that were discovered in the 1950s and 60s. And really the success in ALL are most likely from these reasons listed here. You know, there's a better understanding to the heterogeneity of this disease. So we understand more about the biology of this disease and can risk stratify patients accordingly. And also very important is that over the past several decades, we've had significant improvement in the supportive care of our patients. We have blood products for patients who have bone marrow suppression. Our infectious disease support for all of our myelosuppressive chemotherapy is significantly advanced. And there's a lot of cytokine development um, to help with neutropenia and also marrow suppression. And what really this has allowed, this improvement in supportive care, has allowed this intensification of treatment, um, which has been significant for many tumor types across, and I'll give some examples of some of our therapies. And I think central to the key to all of this is cooperative group research, which has been really important um, in the pediatric setting. So most of our patients have been treated in a cooperative group, and because pediatric cancers is still such a rare phenomenon, in order to learn more, understand more, we've had to work together as a group, and, and pediatric oncologists have really been leading this field in cooperative group settings. So back, way back when this originally all started, the pediatric cooperative groups were primarily the POG group, the National Wilms Tumor Study Group, the CCG, and the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma group. Um, and then since then, uh, since about 2000, there's been a voluntary merge um, of all these groups into what's called now this Children's Oncology Group, which is also the COG. And the COG um, consists of more than 5,000 members um, across the country, Europe, and um, other nations, and it primarily consists of 10 disease committees across all of pediatric cancer and has been instrumental in improving therapy for pediatric cancers. And really what's important to this is that when you think about it, the majority of our patients in the pediatric cancer are treated on clinical trials. So over 60% of pediatric patients versus only about 3% of adults newly diagnosed with cancer participate in clinical research. And really the only time accrual is limiting is when there is not a specific study open. And what this really has allowed us to do is give highly standardized treatments for childhood cancer care. And we know that improvements in outcome and quality are known to occur through standardization.
There's been other reasons why we've had success in pediatric oncology, and some of those are we use smarter use of conventional chemotherapy. For instance, we've had increased intensity when we know um, for anaplastic Wilms tumor as opposed to other Wilms tumors that has vastly improved the survival for patients with a higher risk disease. We've been able to even um, increase the intensity of our tumors, um, such as interval compression of our chemotherapy and Ewing sarcoma, which has demonstrated improvement in survival in that manner. We also have advances in radiation therapy and surgical techniques, which are really important in our local control needs for many of our solid tumors. And more recently, we've had an introduction of targeted therapy, um, such as imatinib for Philadelphia-positive ALL, chimeric antibody for high-risk neuroblastoma, but not all therapies um, have been successful with targeted therapies, and we still need to do more. So this is a schema of multimodal therapy for pediatric soft tissue sarcomas. So we really do use a lot to combat cancer in children. And typical treatment for pediatric soft tissue sarcomas consists of systemic, multi, uh, multi uh, systemic uh, chemotherapy, and most importantly, local control. Um, and that local control typically consists of surgery um, and or radiation therapy. And I want to just give an example of um, the modern treatment regimen for high-risk neuroblastoma to give you guys a better understanding of what, you know, really this means, because it is not an easy thing for children to bear. So for currently for high-risk neuroblastoma, therapy consists of three different stages. We have induction chemotherapy, which consists of five to six cycles of chemotherapy. Um, and these are high chemotherapy um, intensive regimens that you know, cause a lot of myelosuppression and acute side effects. All patients will get upfront surgery. And then subsequently, we'll receive uh, myeloablative chemotherapy. And currently, the recommendation is for tandem transplants, where they receive myeloablative regimens with autologous stem cell rescue, and then followed by local radiation therapy. And then post-consolidation, these patients will then go on to receive um, biologics and immunotherapy, consists of chimeric antibody, IL-2, and retinoic acid. And this therapy is approximately one year long. So this is not something that is light or easy for many children. And yet despite all this, we've had significant improvements in um, high-risk neuroblastoma. And you know, even now, more so in the current age, um, our survival rates probably range around 60%, a little bit higher. But it's still not 100%. There's still many patients with high-risk neuroblastoma that succumb for come to their disease. So this is one of our challenges in pediatric oncology. So despite all that excessive and despite all that multimodal intensive therapy, 15 to 20 percent of children with cancer will die of their disease. And just remember that that success is not equivalent. Patients with high-risk solid tumors, particularly with patients with metastatic sarcomas, um, the outcome is still quite dismal. And when you look at some of our treatment regimens, the patients that do survive, you have to understand that survivorship comes at a cost. More than 80% of children undergoing treatment for high-risk cancer at some point in their treatment experience severe life-threatening or fatal toxicity. That includes many things like myelosuppression, infectious risks, anemia, thrombocytopenia, bleeding, many things that many of our patients um, undergo during therapy, which we consider acute side effects. But then, subsequent to cure, many of our patients have late side effects. So 75% of childhood cancer survivors have a chronic disease by age 40, and 40% 40 of children have a life-threatening um, illness by age 40. And some of the common long-term conditions or late effects include heart disease due to much of our anthracycline use, secondary cancers from our chemotherapy as well as radiation therapy, cognitive dysfunction from radiation and different types of chemotherapy, stroke, kidney failure, hearing loss, and infertility. So to summarize, although the treatment of childhood cancer has been a success overall, we have to remember that not all patients and diseases share that success. 
that acute and late effects of current multimodal therapy in children are substantial, and we really need to improve the current therapeutic approaches for pediatric cancer if we're going to cure more patients and cure patients with less harm. So now I'm going to transition a little bit and talk about a couple of our clinical trials that we have open here that I work with Dr. Sharma on, um, developing different methods to try to reduce some of those toxicities um, in the long term for our pediatric patient populations. So one of the things that we're evaluating, and Dr. Sharma will describe in more greater detail um, in his talk, is what's called magnetic resonance, MR-guided, high-intensity focused ultrasound, or HIFU. And one of these things, the advantages of this is that the MR imaging allows for precise target identification and treatment planning, allows for real-time imaging and temperature change, and this integrated feedback allows the user um, to really precisely control treatment. And the HIFU portion allows uh, the ultrasound transducer to focus acoustic energy, deposit this energy in tissue with multiple thermal and biomechanical um, bio effects. Um, and that could be thermal with tissue ablation um, and coagulative necrosis, hypothermia, which can be used to enhance drug de delivery efficacy, and I'll talk about one of our clinical trials with that. And then things that people are looking at is mechanical, such as shear stress, um, uh, hysterotripsy, or cavitation. And the reason that we think this is an important field to look at in pediatric cancer in general is that there's a lot of advantages to MR HIFU um, over some of the other methods of local control. And primarily, our current forms of local control have been radiation therapy and surgery. So one advantage is that this is completely non-invasive. There is absolutely no ionizing radiation. It allows for large volume um, ablation um, with flexible control over local heating. And it's been well tolerated in adults with minimal or minor um, reversible adverse effects, which is really ideal for pediatric development when we think about the drugs and devices that we want to move forward for children with cancer. So currently we do have a clinical trial of MR HIFU for ablation of malignant solid tumors. So we're looking to see the safety and tolerability of MR HIFU in children with relapse or refractory primary or metastatic solid tumors that are currently located um, in bone or close proximity to bone. Um, and we're looking at secondary objectives to define tumor response, um, looking at other types of functional tumor response, changes in blood immune markers, quality of life, and symptom management. Um, we have a high food multidisciplinary team that reviews the eligibility and imaging, and the patients will undergo um, high food ablation, and they're followed for 14 days to evaluate for adverse events, and subsequent treatment cycles are um, possible. And Dr. Sharma will give examples of some of the patients that we've uh, treated on this protocol, and the tr protocol is currently open and enrolling patients. Um, and the other topic and study I'd like to highlight is our um, Phase 1 study of Thermodox, which is a lysothermosensitive liposomal doxorubicin combined with MR HIFU for children with relapsed refractory uh, solid tumors. And I'd like to highlight this trial because I think this is a trial that really looks at combining novel uh, therapies and novel um, device uh, drug combination uh, to try to minimize long-term acute um, and long-term effects. So what we're trying to do is enhance drug delivery with heat. So lysothermosensitive liposomal doxorubicin is a heat-active formulation of liposomal doxorubicin. And doxorubicin is a common chemotherapy that we use for almost all of our pediatric solid tumors and many of our other cancers in children. Um, and it's known to have activity in many um, pediatric cancers across the board. And what it allows for is release of encapsulated doxorubicin when you heat this area. And there's optimized serum PK such that, you know, if you don't have any heating, these um, liposomes stay within and there's no drug release. But the minute you heat, there's ex drug release um, so that the drug is released in high concentrations of the area that you're heating. So you're really trying to target the area that you're heating. So you're giving this drug systemically but heating it locally and allowing for much higher concentrations of doxorubicin that you normally would not be able to give otherwise, which could be advantageous in, in terms of drug kill and limiting the um, amount of systemic side effects. 
So when they looked in rabbit models of this combination, they saw that there was a 7.6-fold greater tumor drug delivery than just giving doxorubicin alone, and there's a 43-fold greater doxorubicin dosage compared to adjoining muscles. So we can give much higher concentrations that you would not typically be able to do with uh, liposomal doxorubicin alone, which is really important in terms of increasing drug intensification as well as limiting some of the side effects that we see with doxorubicin, um, such as cardiac toxicity and myelosis suppression. So the objectives of this study is to define the toxicities and the maximum tolerated dose or the recommended phase 2 dose of this LTLD and administered in combination with MR HIFU ablation in children with relapsed refractory solid tumors. We're going to characterize the pharmacokinetics of LTLD and determine the feasibility of giving this drug in combination um, with MR HIFU mild hypothermia. And then we'll also look at anti-tumor response and changes in pharmacodynamic immune markers um, using this technology. So LTLD is given over 30 minutes, high flu ablation is immediately followed, and then we um, follow uh, the patients um, for toxicity until uh, three weeks. And then at three weeks, we will evaluate. And if they are eligible for another treatment cycle, they can get another one if they have um, additional target tumors. Um, one of the interesting things that we're looking at with this study is that um, there's a lot of excitement in the field of oncology about immune effects, immunotherapy, and looking at um, how immunity can um, affect cancer. And there is growing evidence that modulation of both adaptive and innate immunity through thermal ablation and mild hypothermia can occur, where changes in cellular immune response, modifying tumor antigenicity, and upregulating heat shot proteins. So we are going to explore HIFU as an immune modulator by looking at blood markers. Um, of these um, markers to see if that we see changes and see if we see any abscopal effects um, on, um, on distant tumors um, treated from the primary site. So in summary, I think what we really do need to think about are novel methods to treat pediatric cancer. We need to do better to cure more patients, and when we cure patients, we need to do better in terms of limiting the acute and late effects of therapy. Um, MR HIFU can be applied to target drug therapy and drug development, and our current program aims to guide clinical integration of this potential paradigm-shifting non-invasive treatment option into upfront therapies. Um, so I'd like to thank um, the IGNITE team, including Dr. Sharma, who serves as the interventional radiologist for all of our protocols, Dr. Dome, um, who is our um, division chief, um, provided some of the slides here, um, as well as the entire high food team. Dr. Um, Peter Kim leads our IGNITE program, and Dr. Sharma will talk more in detail about um, the treatment mechanisms. That is it. Great, Dr. Kim, thank you so much. That was um, extremely informative, and I'm sure there are some questions, but um, as a reminder to everyone, you can ask a question at any time, and we will address them at the end. So if you have any questions for Dr. Kim about her talk, go ahead and put them in the question box there, and we will uh, bring them up at the end. So what I will do now is make Dr. Sharma the presenter here. And at any point, Dr. Sharma, you can uh, share your slides. Share your screen. Looking for that uh, triangle, Raj. Mm -hmm. Show my screen. How about that? Yep. We can see it. You can see it? All right. Let's go to the. OK. Well, thank you again for the, uh, the introduction, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys tonight. And um, Arang has already done a, a really great job of laying out the um, landscape of pediatric oncology and sort of the central role that uh, cooperative groups play and how things are very different between the adult world and the pediatric world. Um, in terms of uh, the treatment of the number of patients on very consistent uh, clinical trials. Um, that is something that's unique to the pediatric realm. Um, and what we are trying to do as a group um, is to really work towards a way, uh, a method where we can make tumor ablation in children completely non-invasive. And um, Erang mentioned the uh, advantages of MR HIFU. And um, what I'm going to do is sort of start out by talking about the differences between 
doing ablation and interventional oncology in the adult world versus that in the um, pediatric world. Um, and she's sort of alluded to a lot of these things already. Um, but I want to sort of try to explain from a, um, you know, proceduralist point of view or a device point of view why these differences might um, exist. And then I will um, go into um, three or four specific examples of uh, MR HIFU uh, ablation in children um, that are from uh, Erang's protocols. Uh, as well as one from a fairly common uh, benign bone tumor in pediatrics called osteoid osteoma. So um, with that, um, let's see here, I'm going to try to move forward. Okay. Um, just my disclosures, I think the important thing here on the screen is to just let everyone know that we are talking about an investigational device right now and an investigational therapy um, in children. So Erin showed this slide already, but although she and I are presenting our work today, um, there's a large team that's really helped to, to do this work, uh, mainly at the, the NIH as well as Children's, and we sort of work together on all the MR HIFU stuff. Um, so in terms of comparing and contrasting, you know, the uh, interventional oncology and ablation in adults versus pediatrics. Um, I think if we go back, take a step back and look at the overall um, approach to cancer treatments, um, the broad categories are medical, surgical, and radiation. And although the three categories are similar between the two populations, um, as Erang said, the way they're applied, the consistency with which they're applied, the uniformity with which they're applied is quite different. Um, so in terms of medical therapy, we are talking talking about systemic chemotherapy in terms of surgical uh, treatments where you're really talking about tumor debulking or tumor resection and um, radiation therapy you understand well and often it's combined with medical or surgical. Um, those are similar between adults and pediatrics, but the role of image-guided therapies is actually quite different if you look at the adult and pediatric world. Um, and that is, um, there are many reasons for that, and we're going to get to those reasons, but if you think about it, um, tumor embolization and tumor ablation are fairly well um, defined. Their roles are very well defined in the treatment of adult um, hepatocellular carcinoma, for example, so, you know, chemoembolization or drug eluting bead embolization or um, yttrium or radiation embolization um, that's delivered through a artery that feeds the tumor. Here you see the tumor blush and after treatment you see the absence of tumor blush. That is not something that's uh, really got much of a role in the pediatric world. If you search PubMed you'll probably find, as I did about a year ago, about 13 or 14 papers and most of them, about half of them are review articles and the other half are case series that range anywhere from two to three cases up to about 15 cases. So not a real worldwide uh, experience with embolization. And when you move on to ablation, whether you're talking about radiofrequency ablation like is shown here in the lung or cryoablation as is shown here in the um, kidney, um, the roles of that are much more defined in the adult world than in pediatric world. And the, the, quite frankly, the, the utilization in children is very limited. But why is that? And um, so we can talk on the next slide about the reasons about why this is. So I talked a little bit about uh, the role of embolization that is currently used. It's in the treatment algorithm now. Uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma. It's getting in the treatment algorithm for liver metastases, particularly from colorectal cancer, for example. And ablation in terms of liver tumors that are less than three centimeters or renal cell carcinomas that are in good location and small size, as well as metastatic lesions in the lung and soft tissue. A lot of experience, uh, published experience in ablation and embolization. But these same techniques have really um, uh, not been very well developed or adopted in children. Um, and their adoption is, is limited and challenging for many reasons. Um, the first of these is economic and regulatory changes and challenges. 
device companies don't necessarily want to invest the money in a pediatric market for this. It's relatively small compared to the adult market. To get these things approved through the FDA is a long process and an expensive endeavor for most of the companies. Um, and there are certain limitations of these technologies that are more forgiving in the adult environment and more prominent and can cause problems in the pediatric environment and I'll allude to those in the next uh, slide. Um, there's also I think you know a general hesitation to try newer things first in children. A lot of what we do has been tried in adults and then slowly transitioned into the pediatric population and as Aaron mentioned uh, this is a very protocol driven treatment approach in, in children um, and that the quite frankly the tumors are very different uh, as we talked about no hepatocellular cancer hepatoblastoma is rare no metastatic colorectal cancer and so on so different tumors and different treatment approaches are one of the bigger challenges and can explain why the role is limited um, but let's step back a little bit and just talk about uh, what is thermal ablation, what is image-guided thermal ablation, and really this is the use of heat or cold to cause focal, we call in situ tissue destruction, right? So you're destroying tissue by heating it up to a point where it can no longer recover and it dies because of coagulative necrosis, or you're freezing it to the point where it can no longer recover and dies that way. Um, and there are many options out there now. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is the, um, the oldest and the one that we have the biggest collective experience with. Um, it is a heat-based ablation. There's also microwave and laser ablation. Microwave is catching up and becoming more commonly used in the adult world. Cryoablation is the cold-based uh, thermal ablation. And IRE or reversible electroporation is, is not a thermal but a mechanical disruption of, of cells. Um, but there are limitations on this technology that uh, involve the use of invasive probes and needles. And whether you're talking about RFA or microwave or cryo or IRE, it's really dependent on accurate needle placement and so the imaging guidance is important and the accurate placement of these probes relative to the coverage that you get and relative to the borders of the tumor is very important and something that comes with training and experience um, and is not simply easy uh, you know if, if, so if you have a two centimeter perfectly round spherical tumor and you put a probe right in the middle of it that's great but in life most of the tumors are not two centimeters and perfectly spherical right so that makes it a bit of a challenge and a limitation at the same time um, and, and as you may know there's inability sometimes to reach the target temperature because of tissue properties uh, whether that's heat loss from large blood vessels that are near a tumor or heat sink, I'm sorry, heat sink effect. Um, there are other um, tumor tissue specific properties that sometimes you just can't get the tumor hot enough and this uh, goes especially in the musculoskeletal world when you're working with bones and in the lung as well. Um, the inability to heat conformally, what that means is what I was talking about earlier, if every tumor were a perfect circle or a perfect um, oval, then it would make things a lot easier, but as you know, they're not. They're complex shapes um, in three dimensions, and so what you have to do is sort of overlap spheres or oval shapes to cover the entire lesion, but you don't ever get the really the one-on-one -on -one complex geometry match that you would want. Um, and that's what's called heating conformally. Um, treatment planning and visual monitoring during the treatment are much improved, but they're not uh, optimal. And I'll try to explain that in a, in a case illustration. Um, but you can't visually see with most of these where the temperature is being increased or decreased. The exception is cryoablation, where you do see the ice ball. And by seeing the ice ball, you infer where the, um, the lethal isotherm is, 
um, but with MR HIFU, uh, which we're going to talk about next, you sort of overcome this limitation because you can see uh, in a very like pixel by pixel basis where the temperature is actually being increased and how much it's being increased and what the relationship of that temperature increases to nearby critical structures. Um, you also will not have uh, invasively uh, placed probes or needles. Um, and the, usually within the context of um, your equipment, um, you can heat very conformally because the cells that you placed uh, are going to be very small, as I'll show you. Inability to reach the target temperature is a limitation of the technology, but mainly because of the depth of certain lesions or the size of certain lesions. So it, boiling that down, the difference between the adult world and pediatric world in terms of tumor ablation is that in the adult world we have established roles and a large experience, but in pediatrics we have no established role as of today. Um, and we have to think, as Aaron said, maybe outside the box and look at newer therapies and approaches. And one way to do that is to think about, well, what would be the ideal tumor ablation method for children? Um, well, an ideal one would address the limitations we just talked about. It would be completely non-invasive. It would not be associated with ionizing radiation exposure because, as we heard, that has negative consequences um, later in life. It would probably be better suited for treatment of tumors that are more common in pediatrics, and Aaron showed that slide. The um, area that we've chosen to concentrate on as a group is um, musculoskeletal type tumors, meaning bone and soft tissue. Um, and in kids, these uh, exist in benign categories or locally aggressive and symptomatic categories and malignant categories like sarcomas that Aaron described. Um, and then it would be a one that we could put through cooperative groups when, when it's being evaluated. And in many ways, uh, MR HIFU kind of fits these um, ideals, and that is one of the reasons that our group has um, chosen to further pursue it and develop it in pediatrics. Um, Erang showed this uh, slide earlier, but I think it bears repeating. If you haven't seen one or you don't have one at your institution, um, this device uh, integrates two uh, modalities that you are all going to be trained on. One is MR imaging and one is ultrasound, although the ultrasound you're uh, going to be trained on is diagnostic ultrasound used to create images. We're using ultrasound to create heat, not imaging. But what this looks like is that the, um, the scanner here is a diagnostic scanner, so when it's not being used for this, it can be used to scan um, brains and spines and, and other regions of the body. But what makes it different is this table. So you change the table out, and this table has a window, a treatment window here, under which is the fancy ultrasound transducer, and so that's built into it. So as Aaron said earlier, you get an MR scan to visualize your tumor and to plan the treatment. And then while you're doing the treatment, you also get scans, which are going to report on where the temperature is increasing and how much it's increasing. And then based on that information, you can adjust your treatment plan to avoid damage to critical structures like nerves and arteries and so on. Um, the role of the uh, ultrasound transducer is to really generate high intensity uh, sound waves that generate and deposit acoustic energy into tissues. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the tissue is then destroyed um, through uh, coagulative necrosis. So, in terms of the pediatric tumors that we have uh, worked with so far, um, a common one in the benign category is osteoid osteoma, and I'll explain that a little bit in more detail and show you a few examples of osteoid osteoma treatment with MR HIFU. A locally aggressive, meaning that it doesn't metastasize but causes a lot of uh, symptoms type of tumor is called desmoid tumor, and we'll go into that and show you an example. And then uh, the metastatic tumors are the sarcomas, and we'll show you an example of a patient that was treated on that protocol as well. So how does this MR HIFU work? Well, many places have the MR HIFU unit in 
their radiology departments in the um, MR area of their radiology departments. In our case, we actually have it in the operating room. Um, and um, the reason that it's in the operating room um, is that neurosurgery uses it for intraoperative MRI and also because most of the treatments that we do require um, general anesthesia. And um, so it's in the operating room where we have that capability. In the adult world, you um, use MR HIFU, or MR HIFU is used uh, a lot for uterine fibroid embolization, and that is a treatment that's done usually without any anesthesia and without sedation. Um, so the patient can just simply lie on the table um, and then get the treatment done usually in a couple of hours and then walk off. Um, but how do we do this? Well, we position the lesion, whether it's in a leg or an arm or on the body wall. Uh, we would position that lesion on the treatment window that I showed you. Uh, we would couple just like you um, couple an ultrasound transducer when you're scanning with gel. You would have to couple the tissue um, with treatment window and we use gel pads and we use gel. Um, the difference is that we can't really have air bubbles in our gel because as you know air will block sound waves and so we have to be careful there. Um, and then we get an MRI with the patient in position with the lesion coupled on the window. And based on those images, we plan our treatment. And the treatment planning means you place tiny little cells that are 2 or 4 or 8 millimeters, sometimes up to 12 and 16 millimeters, um, along and over the target and it makes sure that the entire target is covered and that the path of the beam isn't passing through any critical structures on its way to the target or beyond the target. One is called near field, one is called far field, and you can have um, you know, off-target heating if you're not careful in both the near field and far field, but if you position your cells and plan the treatment well, then you should eliminate that possibility. And then you ablate each cell one at a time, and how you do that is simply by pushing a button, and it's not placing a needle, it's not standing there while the RF generator is heating up, it's literally pushing a button and then watching on the monitor as the cell heats up, and then adjusting as you need to. Um, at the end of the treatment, and this is something that's different about MR HIFU ablation, is that we get a uh, another MRI. This is a contrast enhanced MRI and what we are looking for on that contrast enhanced MRI is something called non-perfused volume. So the idea is if you've just heated and destroyed tissue it's no longer perfused and when you give contrast it's not going to light up with contrast. So what we do is we compare that non-perfused volume with the target that was being treated and so the non-perfused volume has to cover the entire target and maybe a little safety margin around that target to have a complete treatment. Um, and then the treatment and the therapy can be repeated if it needs to be at a later date if you haven't completely um, treated the, the lesion. So <clears throat> early on we worked a lot of uh, with just positioning patients and we had volunteers and so on sort of uh, sitting on our treatment table and trying to figure out how we would treat lesions in the leg or the foot and so on. Um, and But this is very important when you're doing HIFU because it saves a lot of time during the treatment and whether you're doing the treatment under anesthesia or whether you're occupying a busy MRI scanner, doing the treatment as quickly as possible and doing all the preparations ahead of time uh, is important and with experience this gets faster and faster. And then after the positioning what this F, the figure F is showing is the coupling of the gel and the arrows show how we've kind of cut out a shape in a gel pad to allow the leg to sort of sit into the pad and then over here the white arrow is showing where we use liquid gel to sort of build up that area because the path of the beam is going to pass through that area and we don't want it to see air along its way. And then after the positioning is done, the coupling is done, then we do the treatment planning and that's shown here in E. Um, the green cell here is really overlying our target in this area. The beam path both in the near field and in the far field is sort of shown by these yellow lines. And then the box here is the area which theoretically could get heated 
in addition to the focal heating that's occurring within the green treatment cell. So that's what we're watching while we're doing the treatment. Most of the work is in positioning and coupling, and once you've done that and gotten an MRI and getting started, then it becomes much easier after that point. So let's go over a few um, case examples. The first is in the benign tumor category. This is an osteoidosteoma patient. Um, before I do that even, I wanna talk to you and make sure that everyone knows what an osteoidosteoma is. Um, if most of you are residents, uh, you will if you haven't learned uh, what this is. It's a benign bone tumor. Uh, it commonly, most commonly occurs in children and young adults. It is diagnosed by both classic imaging and a classic history. Um, it does not require a tissue biopsy to diagnose this. And the classic clinical history is a young uh, patient who has pain that's worst at night and sometimes wakes them up from sleep and it responds to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So the treatment options for this are long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use, but that has its own side effects over years and years. Um, and surgery was the mainstay of treatment um, until the 1990s. Um, and the problem with surgery was it was difficult to localize the lesion. So if you look at the upper right hand image, you can imagine that this uh, hole essentially in the bone is the lesion, but when the surgeon's looking from the external surface, they're not really seeing this. So it's difficult to localize the lesion. And as a result, you might have to take a larger piece of the bone, which then results in uh, more collateral damage and more um, sort of uh, rest and immobility, which can have other morbidities associated with it. Um, and so in the late 1990s, um, a CT-guided radiofrequency ablation was introduced uh, in Boston, and that since then has really become the standard of care uh, for osteoidosteoma treatments, and it is a very good treatment. It is a very good image-guided, minimally invasive therapy with a success rate, which very few therapies really can have, sort of in the 90 to 95 percent rate uh, percentage um, range, but it is invasive, meaning that you have to pass a needle and a bone drill through the skin and muscle, and it does expose both patients and operators to ionizing radiation because CT imaging is used to monitor the needle and to place the probe and so on. So MR HIFU offers us an ability to perform this uh, ablation non-invasively and without any radiation. So this is a uh, case example of CT-guided radiofrequency ablation. This was the first case um, that we did at Children's now nearly five years ago. The um, osteodosteoma is seen here in the yellow. It's in the proximal femur. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a central calcification like this, which is fairly characteristic. And what you're seeing here is the advancement of a bone drill through the uh, skin and muscle and bone. Uh, and then, then the bone drill stops stops here and inside it is the radiofrequency probe which is placed within the nidus itself. Pretty standard to heat this probe up to about 90 degrees and then maintain it there at that temperature for about six minutes and um, at that point the nidus has been devascularized and destroyed and the pain goes away. Now if you look at this image, yes you see where the bone drill is, you see where the probe is, you see where the probe is relative to the osteoidosteoma nidus, and so you've got a lot of information about where you're treating. What you don't see is exactly where the heating is occurring, how far from the nidus, where it's spreading, and where it is relative to um, some nerves that may be in the area. Um, so CT imaging is not as good as MR imaging for that, and certainly the thermometry information um, isn't shown on CT. So that is why we have standardized protocols that say, okay, let's heat it for 90 minutes for, I'm sorry, at 90 degrees for six minutes, and that'll destroy the tumor. Um, in fact, some people have decreased that time to four minutes for critical areas and so on. But really the issue is that we can't see exactly where the heating is occurring. Now, 
in distinction to that is uh, MR treatment of osteoidosteoma, and these are three patients uh, out of our clinical trial of nine patients so far. And in each case, you see on the diagnostic CT the nidus here and here and here. The bottom image is, a, is actually a great toe, and the patient has an osteoidosteoma there. Um, when we get an MRI during the treatment, this is what the osteoidosteoma looks like here here with the green arrow still pointing to the nidus. Um, if we were to give contrast, there would be a lot of soft tissue edema as well as enhancement of the nidus, but we don't do that before the treatment because we're going to heat the lesion. We then plan this cell is being placed on top of that nidus. We'll probably use two or three uh, cells like that, but placing them on the nidus here in this case, here in this case, and here in this case. And then while the treatment's occurring, watching these individual pixels get up to a certain temperature and we're trying to get sort of to the 60, 70 degree range and the red color would indicate that. And I think this is probably the best example of very, very, very focal heating to 70 degrees just overlying the nidus. And then once you're done with the treatment, um, you get a um, contrast enhanced MRI and we do subtraction imaging here and this black area here and this black area here and this black area here is the non-perfused volume. And so what that means is that the heat has destroyed that tissue and no vascular structures in that issue exist and therefore the contrast can't get there. And so if that zone overlaps and covers your target, then you can be sure that the treatment is complete. So um, this is just an example. It was shown in the last slide too, but specifically I'll give you the history. This is a 10-year-old girl who had had left hip pain for seven months. She was an active swimmer, but she stopped swimming because of the pain. She had no injury that anyone uh, remembered. Um, she presented with uh, over time with hip pain, they thought it was growing pains or overuse, and then she got an x-ray, and the x-ray was negative, but eventually she got a CT scan, and the CT scan shows this osteoidosteoma here. She also had the classic history of not being able to sleep and requiring ibuprofen, which temporarily relieved the pain, um, and the classic imaging and the classic history was enough for a diagnosis of osteoidosteoma. Um, she was treated here uh, with the cell placement, the focal heating, and then the treatment confirmation, and um, did very well. Her pain was completely relieved in about seven days. We followed her up again at one month and six months and 12 months, and uh, at all those time points, she was sleeping well and not taking any more pain medications, and she'd gotten back to her swimming. Um, I show you this kind of readout because that's what we get after each treatment, and the thing that I want to point out to you is that from the time of the first sonication to the last sonication. Each sonication is heating up a cell, took about 54 minutes. Now, all in all, this treatment actually took about two and a half hours because we had to um, move the patient, position the patient, perform the treatment, and get the patient off and out of the MRI scanner. So two and a half hours of total time, but actual treatment time is 54 minutes, and that compares relatively favorably with doing a radiofrequency ablation because often it takes about an hour to do that as well um, because of the needle positioning, the drilling, and the maintain maintaining the temperature. So we uh, have recently published our work, but this is a cohort of nine patients here, and it's a busy slide, but the left column here shows where the osteoid osteomas were located that we treated in these nine patients. It gives you an idea of patient characteristics here, um, age and, and weight and size and so on. And then the lesion characteristics just below that in terms of how many months they had symptoms before diagnosis, how large the osteoidosteoma nidus was, how much bone thickening ha it had around it, and then the therapy characteristics talk about how long it took in terms of anesthesia time, the procedure time, and recovery time, 
And then the most important thing is probably here, and that is that in eight out of nine patients, we saw a complete response. One out of nine patients had a partial response. And um, we've now figured out probably that the reason for that is that this patient had an osteoidosteoma that was located in the intramedullary space, about 10% R, and they are probably not ideal candidates for MR HIFU. Um, if you look at the clinical response, we use pain scores, and you can see here that their pain scores in our patients um, decreased from an average of about six to about zero in a week. Um, how many of the patients were using NSAID medications, all nine at day zero, and the one with the partial response at 28 days. Um, in terms of sleep disruption, eight out of nine reported uh, sleep disruption before the treatment, and the one partial response still had some sleep disruption at the end of the month. That partial response patient was treated with radiofrequency ablation and did well. So that's our work on the osteoid osteoma, but let's move on to the locally aggressive tumor. These are desmoid tumors. Um, you may, may or may not know what a desmoid tumor is, but it is a locally aggressive tumor and it's infiltrative monoclonal proliferation of myofibroblasts. Um, the problem with these tumors is that they can grow quite large. They occur both in the abdomen and in the extremities. Uh, we treat patients that are not desmoids in the abdomen, uh, but they cause pain, they cause motor or sensory deficits from nerve involvement, they can cause uh, problems with um, uh, movement and contracture because of their muscle. So here is a patient with a relatively large uh, desmoid of the leg, here's a relatively large uh, desmoid of the chest wall in a relatively young patient. Um, the problem with these is that there isn't a very effective medical therapy, and uh, when surgery is performed, there's a up to 50% uh, recurrence, local recurrence rate, even after a complete resection. And oftentimes, when there are not clear margins, um, the treatment is combined uh, with radiation therapy, but even then, we can get recurrences. So although not malignant, they can cause a lot of problems locally and symptomatically. Um, our patient here is a 15-year-old girl who's very active. She plays soccer and basketball uh, in high school. Um, she had undergone a surgical resection and radiation therapy for a relatively large lower extremity desmoid that extended um, sort of uh, in the back of her leg. Uh, in the thigh region um, down to below the knee and the calf region. Um, at the age of 12, like I said, she had surgical resection radiation, did well, but had local recurrence about two years later. Um, she was treated with chemotherapy, one of which um, had to be stopped because of dose limiting toxicities, and the other um, did not really control the progression of the disease. Um, at, the, at that point, her size of the desmoid was increasing and the pain was limiting her activity. She was not playing sports anymore and so on. She was not walking normally. And um, really because of her prior radiation and the extent of her prior surgery, she didn't have any more surgical options. So she was treated for this um, desmoid tumor with uh, focused ultrasound or MR guided HIFU. And I'm going to show you a few images of how this was done. Now, unlike osteodosteoma, these are much larger lesions, and so we have to plan a lot of cells. Although the treatment is done one cell at a time, we plan several cells to cover as much of the lesion as we think can be safely treated, and then we ablate one cell at a time, um, looking with MR thermometry, to, which is a sequence which reports where the heating is occurring, and then after the treatment, after you've treated all the cells, you get a, like I said, a contrast-enhanced MRI. These are subtraction images, and this dark area here is the area where the tumor is no longer enhancing both in the um, sagittal and axial planes. Now, we purposely didn't treat some of these um, edges here, and that was because they were close to critical structures, such as nerve and so on, and even um, to the skin. And so one of the side effects of this treatment is that you can have injury to the nerve if you don't see it and can't avoid it, or to the skin if you, the heating gets too close to the skin. And so we, while we monitor it, um, we are still very early in our 
treatment, this was only our first patient. And so as you get more experience, you'll be able to avoid some of these complications. But what I want to show you is that after treating all of these cells here, one at a time, we had a pretty good volume. Um, and this is the skin burn that the patient had. Um, unfortunately, it did take a while to heal. We think that's because she had prior radiation to this area, but it healed with conservative treatment, um, and the patient did obtain pain relief and was able to play soccer again and is doing fairly well. I believe she's about seven months out now, and she'll be coming in shortly for um, a repeat scan and possible treatment of the areas that were left behind. And here's her follow-up imaging. So this was the pre-treatment scan. Uh, very uh, enhancing large tumor here. Uh, just after the treatment, this dark area is the area that we ablated. As I said earlier, we left this portion of the tumor alone, and the reason is because we know that nerves and arteries that we don't want to injure run through there, and we can't see them very well. Um, and then three months later, the area that's treated here is beginning to shrink. The area that's untreated, of course, is not shrinking, and perhaps here may even be growing a little bit. And um, we'll be getting another follow-up scan to see how that's behaving in the next few weeks. So that's desmoid tumors, and then the last category is metastatic tumors, and the example here is uh, sarcoma, and specifically rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, this is a patient who, uh, when we met her, was seven years of age, but she had been diagnosed with a large pelvic um, rhabdomyosarcoma when she was three. She, at that time, she had chemotherapy and surgery, as well as uh, post-operative radiation. Um, she had a recurrence, unfortunately, at the age of six and was um, treated with chemotherapy at that time, but the tumor size uh, when we met her was increasing despite the chemotherapy. And um, she had some increasing pain and altered walking gait. And so the, tr the goal of treatment here was local control and pain palliation. Um, so what I'm showing you here is in the green outline is the patient's rhabdomyosarcoma, and this is um, sort of the HIFU transducer and the beam overlaid and the heating that was seen during the treatment. And as you can see, the heating is conformal, and what I mean is it, it really outlines the tumor that we're treating. And that's way, the way the cells are placed. It's hotter back here because the bone here is absorbing the heat, and so it's getting hotter here. Um, and that's a principle of bone heating with ablation. Um, during the treatment, and then this shows you here the number of cells that were required and how they were overlapped to get sort of a complete treatment of this lesion. Um, here is her pre-treatment scan and the three-month follow-up scan, and what you see here in both axial and coronal plane is that this enhancing mass here is no longer enhancing, and we have sort of a boundary that we created the way that we, um, by placing the cells the way that we did. And um, so that's what I mean by conformal heating, and you don't have to have just elliptical or spherical ablation zones, you can have conformal heating zones and ablation zones as is shown here. So uh, to, to summarize, um, our experience here is young uh, with MR HIFU ablation, but we feel that this is a very um, important technology for us to develop in pediatrics because of its non-invasive nature, because of its um, non-ionizing radiation exposure, um, and for other reasons as well, as Arang mentioned, we're planning on evaluating this technology in drug delivery in addition to ablation, but so far we've treated nine patients with osteoidosteoma, three with desmoid tumors, and then one at each of these, these tumors here uh, with 15 patients and 17 um, treatments to date. So with that, uh, thank you very much. This is our HIFU team here. and. Um, I think um, we'll deal with the, the questions in a little bit.